Welcome to a new episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. My name is Joe Haverman, and I'm super happy to finally have had the opportunity to get in touch and on record with Claudia Frick. Welcome, warm welcome, Claudia. Nice to have you. Hi. Hi, nice to be here. So, Claudia, I've I've come across you. I think we've also met, I don't know if you actually talked there, but I saw you at the Chaos Communication mm -hmm. Congress, which I think that was a year before the pandemic hit, 20, 20, 18, 2018, yeah. Yes, 2018, yeah. So yes, year, yes. Years before. Cool. So, and that, where you also gave the opening speech on research integrity and open access. And so, first of all, yeah, so there's so many topics we are, we are going to talk about. <laughs> but maybe um, let's start with um, a little bit about your background. Um, you're now a professor, um, broadly um, working on science communication. And wait, uh, let me, or tell us yourself. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's 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 actually not not that that easy. So I I always have to think about it myself because I'm a professor for information services and uh -huh. scholarly and science communication. So in in German, so I work in Germany. So mm -hmm. we it's one word for science and scholarly communication because the German language doesn't distinguish between both. Mm. So I always have to think about it in English as well. <laughs> All right. So, oh, and that I think is also a dispute in the Anglophone language. Ah, yeah. is it? Nice. Yeah, okay. That's okay. interesting. Well, for me, it's not clear what the difference really is. Well, and so far that science is purely scientific also, or like referring to anything that has to do in any persons and stuff that have to do directly with the research process, where scholarship is more broadly defined, mm -hmm. including librarians and research managers and or what's the um, just... the most the most um, interesting uh, way to distinguish between both is that scholarly communication is between researchers. So researchers talk to each other and in the scientific community. Um, so it's like um, more of an Oh. internal discussion and communication um like with journal articles on conferences in group meetings oh, okay. um so stuff like this and well, science communication is everything that goes out like or, or comes in into the system or goes out of the system so like doing a podcast where you try to <laughs> to reach um people who are have nothing to do with the scientific community um so you where you want to reach out and talk to the public talk yeah. to other stakeholders um, so this is more the science communication part, but I always struggle with the science because science doesn't include in, in its name humanities and it social does. sciences, but they are included. So that's, it's difficult. Yeah, in my, in my world and understanding, it does include all disciplines for, I yeah. think, for the American kind of definition of open science. And that's also a struggle, but in the UK, there's a, again, like they distinguish between science and humanities and social science yeah 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 um hmm. yeah and then i think there was also in the community at large there was a like are there's recurring conversations do we have to rename open science and at some point it was just not now it's a fixed term let's run with it and yeah it's hard to change um after such a long time when it's in use mm -hmm. uh, yeah okay interesting so um but yeah that makes a lot of sense and i just wanted to add like this particular podcast i think is more of a scholarly podcast in that sense but of course not exclusively so so also any listeners out there who find joy and entertainment in our conversations you're most welcome to stick around <laughs> i mean i mean that's that's what open science is we have exactly. our scholarly communication and we open it up for everyone so that's that's how yeah. open science works. So yeah, perfect. Right. And I might also like what, what also researchers have an opportunity with, like as we communicate amongst ourselves, um, to then also consider particular stakeholders of our specific research projects we're working on, and then deliberately reaching out to those. Um, yeah. And that's then science communication from like you know, outside the ivory tower kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. interesting yeah okay so back to your vita <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's what i'm now 
yeah. <laughs> okay and yeah like wh why why this career and um was that also your field of study as an undergrad um, no absolutely not um i um yeah i, I have a, a kind of well, it looks very random, like a random VC from the outside, because I started to study physics um, and uh, specialized on atmospheric physics over the time. So um, I did my um, my PhD also in atmospheric sciences. So I'm uh, so I'm really kind of a STEM child. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'm. I the modeling of um, numerical weather prediction stuff and so that's where I come from so I have a lot of um, background in physics meteorology atmospheric or climate and everything around this mm -hmm. and after some time working in this this field um, I thought that I would want to talk a little bit more about how we talk <laughs> I wanted to know a little bit more about how we communicate in science because there are some issues and then I moved um, my field of expertise and started to work in a scientific library and that's <laughs> where I stayed for uh, I think seven or eight years and did my master's uh, on top of my PhD on library and information science and was really deep into scholarly communication mm. and open science and open access and that's how I ended up here <laughs> <laughs> and I did a lot of science communication so I'm I mean science communication is something that I really did a lot in the past so yeah you're um oh should we talk about twitter today as in because we can talk about mastodon i've been on mastodon since 2018 oh, okay i've come across your tweets like almost on a daily basis on twitter or probably on a daily basis like and have not anymore here not anymore yeah okay not anymore i i stopped uh, using twitter actively like a few months ago um, so I, I still check in, I still reply, um, and very, very rare occasions I actually tweet something, but most of the time I'm on Mastodon. I've been there before for a long time, but it changed over the past month a lot. I guess. So my fear was that it can never be as much of a science communication tool as Twitter has been and so forth, because I assume Ooh. it would be quite... You know, for for the geeks and nerds like us. Yeah, it is. It is more of a scholarly communication tool because right. we talk. Uh, there are a lot of scientists and researchers mm. and people who are in the scientific community or around it, librarians and everything, data stewards. They are all all there. So it's more like an a scholarly discussion that's going on. So mm. between colleagues or in the community, um, and. There is also a lot of science communication. There are other people that are interested in it. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, the the majority in the past have always been some some geeks or people who are really interested and care about data security and mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, their um, what they share, um, what data they are willing to share, and what platforms they are on. So this has changed over the past month so the community right, yeah. changed and we will see how how we end up mm. uh, but it's interesting to see and i like that the community changed i actually did something that i haven't done before i deleted my old tweets <laughs> because i used it very privately in the past the, okay. this account and suddenly a lot of people came in and it was really crowded and a lot of people started following and i realized mm. oh that's that's different now. Now we are having a lot of colleagues here, and I think it's great. But um, yeah. yeah, it's a new experience. That's that's also a question I often get in courses that I give on social media for researchers for the purpose of science communication. Because, like, give or take, we I mean, social media we often connect, or I also sometimes connect with. Oh, um, yeah, commercial platforms and my, that are suddenly using our data which is why Mastodon exists in the first place. Mm. Um, and yet they serve a good purpose as in science. Yes, yes. Um, so it's a give and take. And it's just a matter. I always told participants, um, like we're here to exchange experiences amongst whoever's already using the tools or not. And I can show you what I know about those. And also the drawbacks and what you're actually paying for, mm. thinking it's free. I mean, free of 
financial cost while you're paying with your data and then make an informed decision if this the value is good enough to sell your data yeah. or throw away your data um that you get but uh i was going somewhere with this oh yeah and then what you just said so another a question that i often got then should i use it only for personal or professional purposes or both and i was thinking well it's up to you first of all but again make an informed decision and think it through as but i often feel like why not for both as much as I mean, think <laughs> that we don't spend 24 seven on them and only share what we also just personally would like to see from others. <laughs> and there's <laughs> Hopefully. only people who overdo it. Yes, mm. so that's, a, that's, yeah, it's a very personal decision and it's really, um, um, both is totally valid. I mean, there are many accounts that solely share like their journal, articles and talk about um, their research or talk about research in general stuff like this and this is totally fine mm -hmm. um, um i personally don't do that i have both in one so i like a two one two in one thing um and share both because that's how it started because i started as it was a private account on mm -hmm. Twitter, I must have done. It's always been a private account to just yeah. play around. I, I'm I'm on science communication. I just try every social media platform that I can that I see. I will just try it just to understand. Mm -hmm. So um, I've started always as a private account, but I'm one person, and my interests are science stuff. It's, it's science <laughs> stuff. So I just. I just start always to talk about science because that's just what. I do. So it's always mixed. Um, and I like it. For me, it's okay. And as you said, I still decide what I want to share. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm, I don't share anything at all, or it's, it's really up to you what you share. Um, but for sure, you can change your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can say, okay, I, I did it in the past both in one account now i want to split this up and have one private account that's protected mm -hmm. like most people have on instagram and one that is official has another name where i just solely talk about science that's both is okay and yeah. you can always change your mind facebook at some point i think that also still they had lists or kind of um, a feature where you could post to only your family or only your friends and not the public so that's also, you can also look into the features that the platforms comes with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Twitter has lists. But anyways. Yeah, Instagram um, has this feature that you can share with friends. Yeah. And they could, do define who's your friend. <laughs> that's a special group. Oh. I, yeah. I, I heard, first I heard Instagram decides for you who's your friend. All the people. <laughs> no. Like, no, 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 it's, um, you it's can far. you can assign this to specific people and decide okay. which with whom you want to share yeah makes sense so why did you decide to delete your history your chat history or post his tooth history on mastodon my, my tooth history um just because um i just um it it was not a very active account so there were two really, really far from the past like ye one year old tooths or something like this and i thought that's I don't want to look through all of them, whether something was really private because oh, okay. mainly I talk to other nerds and then I just said, okay, well, uh, mm. then I can just delete it. That's totally fine. I've never deleted anything on Twitter. My Twitter feed is like existing from the day <laughs> where I started and it's up to now. Um, and on Mastodon, I just kept the first two. <laughs> Well, that's also and then, on you can still I forgot what it was but you can still look up the first ever tweet yeah absolutely hello world yeah. or something random yeah mm -hmm. yeah hmm. so yeah it has something to it but then again like deleting digital stuff also helps our planet in letting go of the carbon emission pressure <laughs> 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 but um yeah i'm i'm trying to at least go through my emails once in a while but i keep accumulating building digital habits it's, it's a thing okay yeah so oh and then did you come across i think it was in 2016 around the time there was a hashtag going wide on twitter and facebook 
I'm a real scientist um where mm. scientists would um have pictures taken of themselves following their hobbies and being yeah random human beings mm. <laughs> to yeah. you know as to burst the paradigm ideal of what a scientist is supposed to look like as a yeah. you know bearded old man who looked like albert einstein or maybe not bearded in his case well he had a beard right anyways yeah. um yes I remember that, and I think that this is super important, and it's it's important on on many levels. Um, if you want to share who you are, so mm -hmm. beyond being a scientist, um, it has so much value for people who have haven't had any representation so far for scientists. So they look, what is a scientist? How how are they? What are what do they do? And we all have this preset ideas in our head that were built by society but what we see in tv what mm -hmm. we see on social media and if we only see these flawless people making great uh, inventions and um, doing a lot of um, great experiments and stuff um, we we miss out that most of the time doing research is about failure <laughs> and, <laughs> and being frustrated It's quite daunting and, as a profession yeah but i mean that's that's really a thing and um i really try with my social media appearances to defeat the stereotype to just be me and be vulnerable and to show what my personal struggles are because i still decide which ones i share absolutely but i try to do that and really on purpose because i think this is for me also a little bit a part of being open in science mm -hmm. it's not open science but it's been open as a scientist and um i always have still have for myself to to check in with me i am a professor now and then my mind immediately switched to ooh should you do this as a professor and mm -hmm. i was thinking that's that's totally weird just do what you would have done like Uh, one year ago just do what you want to do but I have this picture of a scientist and a professor in my head that tells me specific ways to be mm -hmm. <laughs> as a professor so doing the opposite and showing just how you define um, scientist or professor is mm -hmm. um, really valuable I think yeah I think that's important um, and as you as you spoke now I brought a memory back of my late, late dad who occasionally told me, oh, you have a PhD, you know, you shouldn't do this anymore. What is <laughs> or something stupid? No. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, just just being a bit like too casual in his eyes, like with that title now. And, yeah. And that always brought up a feeling of like, what? Why not? I'm still a human being. I'm still me. I'm still your daughter. Hello. What can I? Yeah anymore or what's now like then let me give that title back <laughs> <laughs> yes it's 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 what i it's what i do it's not who i am <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh yeah okay so okay the chaos communication congress so maybe we should explain yeah. a little bit what that is because it, it happens in germany it arose or is organized by the chaos Com computer club is mm -hmm. that is it yeah Chaos Computer Club, and has become quite an international thing over the years. Yeah. I forgot. I I attended two congresses, I think. So I'm not I'm not a frequent visitor, but but I was quite impressed by by those two events. Um. So yeah, what brought you there, and how how was your? Yeah, I think I approached you at the congress when you had your keynote and, and congratulated you on yeah. it. I think we met. We met afterwards at um, a, a small open science meetup. I think oh, yeah. we organized oh, it with, with uh, Lambert. Wikimedia, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, session, yeah. Um, so what brought me there? <laughs> do you want do, do you want the real story how I ended up on the case communication congress giving a talk about open <laughs> open yes, access? No. <laughs> the real story um, and the Polish PhD professor. You know. Um, you have to know that it's really hard to get tickets. <laughs> I, yeah, that I know. Like, I never yeah. had to organize myself, but I heard others running after yeah. them. Yeah, it's difficult to get tickets. And we were sitting with, um, uh, we're sitting with uh, three uh, friends together um, in Berlin eating burritos. And uh, one just said, well, yeah, just give a talk. 
Huh? And then you get a free ticket. And I said, what should I talk about? That <laughs> Talk about, I don't know, open science or like <laughs> climate change. And I was like, yeah, so I, I, I mean, I could. And I always wanted to give a talk at the Chaos Communication Congress because I like the flair of the Congress and how everyone um, just comes as they are and are wonderful people. And I thought, yeah, it would be nice to can to say afterwards I did a talk at a Chaos Communication Congress. So I <laughs> I wrote an abstract and I'd never expected it to get accepted, <laughs> but it happened. So I had to to actually show up, do this. Um, <laughs> And that's how I ended up in this situation. <laughs> and the card was re the the talk was really good. I was quite impressed. Like as a trainer in science, open science communication myself, I was like, okay, how good can this be? But it was really good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank well you. done. Yeah, it's weird to look back to this. I mean, it's five years ago, and it's it's outdated. Obviously, it's a lot has changed, and it's also interesting to look back and to see what how my perspectives changed so i also see now oh, i would do things differently now and tell a different story or um, mm. um focus on another aspect more that's really interesting i i think um also in the past five years open science and what what i see should be happening or what is actually happening changed so much mm. it's really different yeah, indeed. Yesterday I read through a paper I had co authored with a colleague in 1998, uh, 2019. And mm -hmm. yeah, I have the same experience like you just described. Yeah. Like, I still stand behind most of the, what, I, what we wrote mm -hmm. back then because it's quite coherent. It touches on all the principles and not only open access as of mm -hmm. open science. Um, it explains a little about uh, a little bit about the whereabouts and why do we have this conversation now and what are the actual um, pitfalls and and um, the reasons for for the reform that we so urgently need now um, and also like Rima the other co-author she's from a psychology background and I'm a natural scientist like so mm -hmm. that was also interesting to bring those two perspectives together like, it was quite a process to write the book because we did yeah. the same thing but from different backgrounds like what oh, this is it's so interesting yeah. yeah the different communities yeah uh, and and then also to bring in all the tools and examples so that a re like a broad readership can relate this yeah, because That's normally, interesting. normally these conversations are being had in bubbles, and a, a similar experience I had at a at a conference for librarians, which mm -hmm. I'm sure you also experienced. Like when you talk about open science with researchers, again you speak about the same things, mm -hmm. but librarians as well, but the two don't talk with each other. And the, it seems as if things and policies and tools are being developed in two bubbles, which are meant to work together, and they just don't come together so easily. They just don't talk to each other. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that's it's. I think that's uh, it's such a huge system. The scientific world is such a huge um, structure and community that it is hard to keep track of everything. Mm. That's um, it. Definitely is, and you are kind of living in your bubble you're doing research in your bubble because you are i mean you're doing also interdisciplinary research but um it's still um you come from a specific background you have a specific culture a specific way of doing things and i mean sometimes it's really interesting as a librarian when you have the perspective to see all the different ways of doing open science in all the different research areas and then you talk to someone like like a physicist and say, well, yeah, preprints are still a hard thing um, in um, in the humanities, and and they said, just say, what? That's standard. That's what we do. Like every every time, why wouldn't you? So they don't see that there's anything to do mm. anymore because that's a fixed issue for them. But it's not for everyone, and. Um, I really like that we have this perspective to see these differences uh, and to see maybe why they exist. Mm -hmm. um, if it's even possible to overcome, if we want to overcome, then how open science can work for other disciplines, mm -hmm. how it looks like, because it looks different. That's really cool. But scientists sometimes don't see these other ways of doing stuff. 
Yeah, and interestingly, like I think this is also why I, why I named my company. I don't know. It's weird to call it a company. My one woman show <laughs> access to perspective, like to like this is what I enjoy so much for myself when I finally have this aha moment. Like, whoa, okay, this is how other research researchers mm -hmm. from other disciplines might see it. Mm -hmm. um, or a librarian versus a researcher looks at open mm -hmm. science. Or yeah, this this switch or change of perspectives and putting yourself into somebody else's shoes to better understand what you're actually talking about with someone else. Mm. Yeah, and having the opportunity to see it. I'm. I mean, you, you usually. What are the opportunities to meet with scientists completely out of your field of research, and having the time to talk about details like how do you publish? <laughs> your <laughs> your your texts that mm -hmm. i mean that's a, um that's really a detailed topic usually when you meet with others and do interdisciplinary research you talk about the research topic so the, what 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 will we do and not so much about the how and how do you do it usually so um these opportunities are a little bit rare in mm -hmm. reality yeah sure yeah, with a high pressure mode. So um, we also talked in the preparation, or just before hitting record, we talked a little bit about like um, reasons for not opening up your research as a researcher. So there, mm -hmm. I I think I've said it again on the term open science, but it's been quite a few months where I really struggled with it because it's so misleading. And from my experience, like when I when I remember remember how I would have felt as a PhD student looking at my data. I, like no way I would publish that early or you know somewhere mm -hmm. before spending I don't know how much time cleaning and do you have even have the time to do that <laughs> so it's a, I think it's a fear of disclosure yeah. of the messiness that research naturally comes with and mm -hmm. the process and that's pretty normal but not many of us are confident enough to accept that as as a normal state of yeah uh, or process the data is naturally messy <laughs> and and the well and then we work through it and try to tidy it up and read from it what we can conclude from the research question or to answer that um and now use open data and i tend to say like i tend to go away from from announcement of course announcement about open data is more important to have fair data and again, yeah, also cleaning and, and archiving and depositing. Um, so the work is still there. And that's mm -hmm. also like, it, it's, it goes to all the stakeholders, not only the researchers, because we need more or, or better balanced research budget to allocate for that. Like then there's a need for time and money to, to allow for proper data archiving and documentation and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then so what what are the fears that you've come across of researchers or reasons not to open up their research? Um yeah, and it's one thing to complain about why are researchers so reluctant unless <laughs> you talk to them and then understand like, well, okay, that makes sense. And there are cases of of I mean the, the most obvious thing is oh sensitive data. And you think, yeah, but of course you anonymize your data before you publish it, but that's probably not so easy for once. And it's not it's not um, as straightforward as you sometimes think. I mean, um, this the the movement from Twitter to Mastodon, as we talked that we talked about earlier. Mm. Um, there was also a discussion about the fact that you cannot um, you don't have a universal search function in Mastodon, mm. so you cannot, as in Twitter, just type in any word and it searches through all tweets that ever existed. So that won't happen in Mastodon because the most instances and most users don't allow this to happen. They say we won't, don't want to be indexed in a global index. Hmm. Um, and there was then a discussion that is it, what, scientists were confused. I mean, like, but we want to observe you and, and see what, what, how you, what you do, how you interact. We want to do some like social um, sciences stuff, want to, to see um, reactions around a specific, I don't know, event mm -hmm. uh, and stuff like this. And, um, and then the people said, yeah, but you don't want to. 
<laughs> so want to be part, we want, want, want to be researched. And this is um, a very interesting discussion um, mm. about this. And in the past, there have been a lot of studies on, on Twitter. There are a lot of studies on other social media platforms where people collected tweets and mm. uh, posts, comments, and so on. And you can anonymize a, um, a collection of tweets. You can download 20,000 tweets for a specific event or, or hashtag, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you can throw away all the Twitter handles. But you can. But still... why would you do that? Because, I mean, to, the reason for being on Twitter is people want to be public. Or maybe even not want to, but that's what they agree to. So their consent is already given. Yeah, that's 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 one one way of seeing it. Like, okay, mm -hmm. I um I want to. They they uh, agreed to be to tweet publicly, so they they should know that we can collect these tweets and do something completely different with it. But um, it's not it's not that easy, um, because you still have to think about people will delete their tweets or um, mm -hmm. deeply regret stuff, things like this, and um, it's it's an issue to talk about and. Do we want to do this? Uh, like, for example, really like um, publishing all these tweets that to be there forever. <laughs> mm. um, and it's not it's not that I say that you shouldn't. It's just think about it. Mm. And um, and even if you say, okay, well then let's anonymize. Then let's throw away the Twitter handles. We just take the the tweets because that's what we care about. Uh, the topics um you can still just copy the text of the tweet and hit put it into the search function of twitter and you will get the person who tweeted so mm -hmm. it's not really anonymized so um even if you say no it's really not about the people we just use the text this is okay and i think i feel better with doing this um it still doesn't mean that it is, is completely anonymized so there are some issues in in this, and I think that's it's worth to discuss. I don't think that there's um, a solution. And some people really say, yeah, that they published it, so it's like out in the open. Now we can do with it whatever we want. But um, there are also other ways to look at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I'm quite into global research or science communication on a global yeah. scale and mostly with African scholars, um, but also you know, looking like literally globally as much as that's possible and feasible for one person to capture. Mm -hmm. But, and their um, data anonymization and sensitivity has an, a whole other dimension as if you would only look inside Germany. And even inside mm -hmm. Germany, we have sensitive personal data cases that would, might not apply for the mainstream, but depending mm -hmm. on what research questions we have um and what yeah to what degree do we need to anonymize, anonymize the data is it to like i is it important to capture the gender and then how many genders mm -hmm. are considering that's also like yeah become more um more recent or yeah more of a today's topic um or as ethnic background or yeah, like things like that, where where a disclosure of the data can actually be life threatening for certain mm -hmm. people quite quickly, even inside Ger like within Europe or Germany, where you wouldn't think about that as a yeah as a person who is not um, who is part of the mainstream community and is not directly threatened to me like you know with whatever political persecution or what whatever or exposed to racial um pressure mm -hmm. um so these are things but then also and we could you know continue talking for two three hours around personal data and and the need for or sensitive data can also have other dimensions but it often only sort of saying that's quite complex again <laughs> already in itself but other sensitive data could be like if you study endangered animal or plant species and you disclose their geolocation and then expose their geolocation to also, um, you know, um, what's the word now? Uh, wild hunting. Ah, uh, there, there was <laughs> not a native English speaker. <laughs> but um, yeah, or 
yeah so that and then what other sensitive data might there be so there's there's quite many the messiness itself like people don't want to come across as you know um unprofessional or why one might they might fear to be seen as as they disclose mm -hmm. and where i think we can learn from and this is also where the cast computer club comes nicely and like open source communities they from what i've seen and understand is they they define themselves in collaboration and you would think researchers as well but it's become so competitive in the past two three decades that um I think that's something we can really learn more and not be so wary about, well, yes, sensitiveness of our data sets, but um, doesn't have to be perfect. And other researchers can very well chip in and help us read more information out of our data or help to clean it up a little further or cleaning the code that, you know, if you're into data science or things like that. So why not embrace the culture of collaboration more outside our research groups as well through scholarly community mm -hmm. that is now yeah i think it 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 does but it still has the limitation that all the scientists all the people doing research have limited time and resources and um it it's like with open peer review you you do open peer review and um, the contributions are not so high because people don't have time to spend so much. I mean, also for standard peer review, it's difficult to find people to do it. Um, and checking other people's data sets or, or using their software, sometimes uh, if it's not something that you actually want to use or reuse, um, might not happen. So mm. um, there might be a lot of data and source code that is open science and available it's open source it's open data it's available but that maybe no one will ever look at mm -hmm. and um so i think it's you should we should always consider um or that what i learned from talking to a lot of people that they always consider the time that they have to put in to create this data set or mm -hmm. to make it um clean it up just to make it um, possibly to be published, that they have the resources that they need, um, whether it's valued by their research group or, or it's something that is encouraged to do. Um, and then they think, does it have really have value? Will there be people that will, will use it? Because I can put in the time, I can put in the effort, I can do all this, but if no one ever really um, looks at it and I just do it for the, the purpose of just to make it public, then they people think about it. Maybe I won't do it because it's really some time and energy I have to put in. So this is not um, saying that they shouldn't do it. It's just one reason that you hear it. Mm -hmm. It takes some resources that they don't have, and mm -hmm. then they think about: Will it be valuable for our community? Is it something that really is interesting for others to reuse? And if they don't mm -hmm. think it is, even if they can't judge it. Mm -hmm. um, they won't publish maybe mm. there's two thoughts that came up now um and yeah thanks for sorry also for the noise the dog's getting uncomfortable and letting us all know yeah thanks for that <laughs> thanks for sharing dog <laughs> so um i i had a conversation also on record and it's probably published by the time we have this on air um, with Richard Poinder, a science journalist from England. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when we talked, um, or he finally pointed me to, but isn't it the data that is the actual research output? And the research paper is just mm -hmm. around, it's actually just the metadata for the data. Mm -hmm. But we treat the it the way around. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. should rather put more mm -hmm. effort into publishing and polishing the data sets and then have a little bit of a less... Uh, concern well I mean the metadata is highly important to contextualize the data set but there's so much fuzz around isn't it funny that your twitter handle was fuzzy what <laughs> yes fuzzy leapfrog <laughs> it's a it's a very science nerdy nickname <laughs> already sorry <laughs> <laughs> we should also talk about why it shows that name well for the nerdiness of it but i wasn't wanted to say so the files around um yeah the research articles and then 
there's often with the publishers, with the big five publishers at least, or also generally in scholarly publishing, mm -hmm. it's really difficult to get hold of the data that's mm -hmm. it's basically telling mm -hmm. the story or that the, the article is referring to and making claims about. Mm. So, I mean, if you have yeah. really good metadata, then publishing the data um, can be considered like the main output that we have. Um, if you are in a research area that produces a lot of data. So now we have to talk about how do you define data? If you are in a um, in more in a, in the humanities, you might have really a different idea of what data is. For interview so, data, right? But then you have data points like the questions, the answers, the, what, the quality. Yeah, but also literature. If you're doing literature oh. reviews, using like interpreting like really texts and books and going deep into stuff like this, then the data that you produce is the text that you produce. Right. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking. Yeah. I was maybe thinking. maybe you can say the bibliography is um, right. so all the sort of resources you have. But if you are doing an interpretation or using a specific model, look to look at a specific book, then what you create is text. It's an interpretation. It's yeah. Okay. This is the data. So <laughs> it it really is mm -hmm. is different. Um. Yeah. I think, but. The connection between the data set and um, publications about it, I would always say it's not one data set, one publication. It can be many data sets, one publication, but it can also be one data set, many publications. So it's there's no mm. relation like this, but usually there are mm. at the moment like these one-on-one -on -one, mm. um, things. And um, when I look back I, regarding this Mastodon Twitter discussions, I remember and I think I, I can find the paper again that there was there was a paper about um, Mastodon and content warnings, mm -hmm. and they did some research. They downloaded like uh, they, they say they had some tools downloaded and um, doing some um, analysis about it, and the paper got was taken down. It was removed by the publisher because there were some ethical concerns, there were some legal concerns, and the data set also got um, um, removed from the repository. I think the data set actually got removed first. Mm. Um, and I think this is an interesting example on um, what can happen if you publish data and what people also, uh, scientists think that can happen when they publish the data. Mm. I mean, it's a lot of, it's a little bit about um, being afraid that something like this might happen to them. And when the data set gets removed, then the paper is also removed, mm. stuff like this. So, the, so there is a connection and then both gets um, removed. And I think this is um, something that we have to address and to acknowledge that scientists have this fear that this can happen. Um, but on the other side, I mean, we have to discuss this yeah. Also, <laughs> Even if we don't publish the data, we have to discuss whether we should um, store and get this data. And yeah, yeah. I I feel also isn't this why we do research in the first place? Because we, I mean, we uh, like we won't argue. Okay, there's I think there's two types of researchers from what I've seen in my courses when I ask the question, why did you become a researcher? And <laughs> about fifty percent, give or take say i actually want to make the world a better place by curing a disease or yeah. mitigating climate change or whatever but usually those two <laughs> mm -hmm. or i'm i'm just interested i'm curious and i love research because it allows me to continue to pursue my childish uh curiosity and that's <laughs> also a valid i mean that's a valid point yes that's it is about accumulating knowledge and what do you do with the knowledge you 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 share it you give it to the world and how do you do that you publish and yes and then once it's published it's exposed for feedback and the feedback can go one way or the other yeah, yeah. but um this is this is a point that where i usually um really um I like looking at scientists that tell me they don't want to do um they want don't want to publish open access because um they say, yeah, we want to keep it uh, um, um, out of the public because we still want to um, get some 
Oh, I don't know. So like in, in engineering or something like this, they want to do something beforehand, like doing some commercial stuff or anything like this. Mm-hmm. Um, or they say, we don't want uh, um, immediate uh, uh, flashbacks or feedback or stuff like this. And I say, but if you publish closed access, you still publish. It's, I mean, yeah, of, I mean those who whoever pays control. these yeah. $30 dollars <laughs> or has access to, <laughs> to a library, still can read this paper it's not like a private thing that nobody sees if you publish it behind a paywall but sometimes this is what people think happens they say mm. oh if we publish open access suddenly everyone will will see it and they say no it's just like an add-on of the people who usually can't afford mm. <laughs> um it's not that you didn't publish if you published behind a paywall you still did yeah And then the sad thing is, have you ever done the exercise? I actually haven't, but I will. Like, try and find your own papers through an indexing database. Like, I, I'm just naming the lens because that's my favorite. There's also dimensions I'm not going to. Should I name them? Mm-hmm. Some web of science just because they're closed and highly expensive. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yes. But there are many others. Or Google Scholar, as messy as it is, but try mm-hmm. and find your own articles. How likely is it that you spend less than 10 minutes searching for your own article? yeah oh it's hard I mean, and if you have title, we we use the keywords like how would you yeah. expect somebody else to find your article well for google scholar i i can't tell you who's who how it is for the others because i mean <laughs> google knows me oh. and uh it's, okay it's no, on... we're talking like an anonymous browser window okay like private, private. anonymous browser window uh, somewhere in the world yeah i think that's an interesting thing to approach to 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 look at it and For what keywords would my papers actually show up? Well, the ones you gave to the publisher, to the journal, as you submitted. They also, they for that, yeah. they also ask you, please give us like seven to ten. Some keywords. do, yeah. Some others just assign Other. keywords. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, you could do that. I mean, yeah, it's, it's interesting, but that's... And that's so sad because, you know, like there's publication pressure for the prestigious journals, like the Nature and Science. Mm-hmm and whatever in social sciences um, as in a uh, high impact factor journal but they can also not solve this issue for you you will still have zero citations even if you lend to three nature papers just because yeah it's not yeah, it's not for yes that's true yeah And actually, like, there's been research into preprint sharing, which to me is also publishing, mm-hmm. but there is a discussion mm-hmm. around that. No, it's only published if it's actually went through high impact of the journal peer review. But, um, okay, happy to take up that debate somewhere else. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, right. but I mean, I mean, we can talk about this, like, like endlessly, but I, I think the, the main um, theme that we, we had over this um, this time is, like, that open science is not only about just making everything available yeah um it really needs some thought some um cleanup some creation of metadata um some thought into the future some thoughts into the past um it take something it says something about yourself about the scientists that does the research mm. um about your resources your time and open science can also be about yourself in opening up on who you are and how you do research mm. um uh, on on social media so open science is more than the the output we create it's the way that we mm. live discuss um And yeah, I think this is the, the major theme that we touched upon today. I think so, yeah. Um, there's like a hundred other um, talking strings that I would love yeah. to. But maybe we can do a part two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. But yeah, um, looking at the time, was mm-hmm. there follow-up meetings to this. Thank you so much for this conversation. And maybe there is a follow-up. Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll maybe that. <laughs> <laughs> it's been it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, change about science. Yeah, quality communication and crisscross. <laughs> <laughs> It was nice to to talk about all these topics to just let the conversation flow. I really like this. Yeah. Cool. Okay.
Okay. See you soon. Thank you.